Thank you, Larry. All right, open your Bibles this morning to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, you're familiar with this portion of Scripture, I'm sure. We're looking over, starting over in chapter 5 and then part of chapter 6 in 2 Corinthians. I'm sorry, did I say first? 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5 in 2 Corinthians is probably one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It uh, is one that tells us to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, and talks a lot about different things. And we're going to look at a portion of it over here in starting at verse 17 today. I've entitled it, A Privileged Position. We as Christians have a privileged position, don't we? We get to work with God to accomplish his goal in the lives of people. And as Larry was just talking there about the man in the water, uh, witnessing it even as before he drowned. So we see we all have a responsibility. And actually, I've got this is broken down into three parts. I got by assignments, first, second, and third assignment that God has for Christians. And we'll see how God can use you and use me in this world that we're in today. This is a change. We kind of change going from one chapter to the other. If you're familiar, you know, the Bible wasn't written chapter and verse. It was written just like a letter, Paul's letters to the churches. They were just letters and had paragraphs, of course, but basically they're different. And sometimes the preceding chapter and the beginning of the next chapter kind of go together. And that's where we're at here today. So I'm going to start off. We're going to look up here in, in uh, chapter 5 and verse 17. Quote this verse a lot. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So we see the reason I started here, this is a, like a born again. We're born again right here where this is someone that's got saved and they're that new creature and the, we're, the past is behind us and we now have a future to look forward to and that's what he's talking about. He says in verse 18, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us, and that's the word I'm going to key on here in a moment, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20 goes with those two. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. Pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. So we see here that God has a, an assignment for you and I, and it has to do with reconciliation. So what does reconciliation mean? It means to be changed from an enemy to a friend, to be restored, uh, to be brought back together, and, uh, you know, if you, under, if you understand the, the relationship with the fall of man, at one time, God and man walked along together in the garden, didn't they? They communed in the garden, and then sin entered the picture, and we had this division. And ever since Adam sinned, we see this division has gone through all of mankind. So God then sent his son, and that's what we read here, to reconcile us, to restore us back to that fellowship that was with God in the beginning, that man had with God in the beginning. So you and I now have that responsibility to carry this out. Notice in verse 18, he says, we have given us the ministry of reconciliation, and then he gives us the word of reconciliation in verse 19. So we have that responsibility, and what is it? It's like Larry was talking about, to share the good news. Share the good news of the gospel that man can be reconciled to God, that we don't have to live a life separated from God. We can be joined with him and work with him, as we'll see in verse 1 of chapter 6. So how well are we sharing the word of God? How well are we showing people God in us and give them the desire to know us? You know, there's, it's been said that less than 3% of the people ever, of Christians, actually share the gospel. Actually, 3% of born-again Christians, evangelicals, I said, actually share the gospel with anybody. How many times have you, you just in your own mind to stop and think, how many times have you actually sat down with someone and said, uh, this is the good news, and maybe not in these words, but uh, that Christ died for your sins. And that through faith and trust in his shed blood, you have eternal life. You can be forgiven of your sins. You don't have to face condemnation from your sin. We talk about people going to hell. You don't have to worry about going to hell. You'll go to heaven when you die, when you receive Christ as your Savior. How many, how many times have you shared that in your life? Many people don't want to share that. We know it. We know people need it, but we won't tell it. Why, do, why don't we tell it? I, I tell you, I think one reason we don't is the fact we get intimidated. We don't feel comfortable doing it. Not only that, we don't realize what hell is like. We don't realize what it's like to have the, the, the pain that never goes away. 
We don't realize what it's all going to be like down there. And there's different thoughts about what the people in hell go through. Is it the trials and temptations in life that they succumb to and they give in to the drugs or whatever? Or whatever? Do they have to live with that all of their life? Do they have to remember when they heard the gospel and they rejected Jesus Christ? See, when we, when we don't really comprehend the, the danger, we have a tendency to shy away from it. We don't have the, the desire then to share. A, a good example is, you know, uh, how, how quick do you go to the doctor? Well, some people go right away. But most of us have a tendency until it really gets bad. And then, well, this ain't getting any better. I'm going to go to the doctor. But if it's just a little pain, a little discomfort, I don't know about you, but, you know, doctors and I, I got a good doctor. I'm not knocking the doctor. But, yeah, that's don't care to go see him that much. But when things get, when I realize it may be getting serious, then I call up and I don't want to wait another week or two. I want to get in to see him right away. And I think if we looked at hell and condemnation that way, maybe we would have a greater desire to share with those brothers and, those brothers and sisters in our family, those cousins, those, all our family, about Jesus Christ. See, the, again, it gets back. We have the ministry. That's our, the, I used the term assignment. Here. Our first assignment is what? We have the ministry of reconciliation because I've experienced it. If you're saved, you've experienced that uh, that reconciliation with God. We're back into his favor. We're now in the fellowship with him. We're born into his family. So when we look at these verses, he said, this is what you're called to do. And we are ambassadors. That word in verse 20 there, he talks about us being ambassadors. Once an ambassador, that's a person that's sent, isn't it? We send ambassadors all over the world, all these different countries. What do they do? They're to go represent our nation in these other countries. And they're to, they're to convey what we feel and what we think and what should be done and shouldn't be done in the world around them. And the idea is that's what we're called to do. We're ambassadors. We're to go out into the world. We go, God sends us out into the world, and we know that now and then, we talked about that over in, uh, did a study over in First John, and now and then they talk about the sin unto death. When we get so caught up in sin, God says, Ambassador, come on home. You're not representing me right. And so we want to be sure that we're doing our part, that we go out and we share the gospel, share the good news with people, and that's our assignment. That's our responsibility. And in, in verse 21 in chapter 5 in 2 Corinthians, we see, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the, the righteousness of God in him. So that's that, that, there it is in a nutshell. That's all about it. That, that's what it's all about. That Christ took our sin and gave us his righteousness. And, you know, I always talk about that being the, the great transfer. That's it. A great switch. <laughs> He, he took the rottenness of our sin and gave us the greatness of his righteousness. But it wasn't like uh, Christmas time. He just didn't give that to us. He went and he suffered dearly to be able to do that for you and I. So when we stop and realize, and sometimes we kind of get, um, I don't want to say hard-hearted toward, but we just don't really consider it. It's one of those things that we don't want to consider. But when we stop and think what God went through to get us to be reconciled to him so that we can be forgiven of sin. Until we're reconciled to him, that's part of the forgiveness of sin. And he can't get the people that are, that are representatives of him to go out and do what they're supposed to do. You know, just, uh, just a little side note, you know, we've got an election coming up, and no matter where you're at, you should vote. People should vote. I, Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever, you should vote. That's a privilege we have in our country to vote, and you should vote. But you realize that it's a very small percentage of Christians that vote. We might holler around about the, the, uh, the abortion things going on, holler around about some of the things going on. But if we don't vote, you say, well, my vote don't make any difference. If the last election, if you listen to anything that happened in 2020, a lot of states were decided by 10,000 votes, 25,000 votes. Christians, you need to vote. You need to vote and get out, and, and at least we look at what we can do with our vote to help direct our country in the way that we feel it should go. And Paul, as Paul is writing to the Corinthians here, he says, you know what? You are given this responsibility, and it's not only a responsibility, it's a privilege. It's a privilege because we get to go and work alongside of a holy God. Our second assignment we're looking at, go down to chapter 6. We then, you and I, Christians, as workers together with him, with God, referring back to that early chapter, we, with God, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. 
It says that the word beseech has the idea of to beg, to plead, to urge. Listen to what I have to say. See, we, get to, we have that privilege of working with God, and so what happens is uh, God's at work, and you know what? We are his mouthpiece. We are his worker out here. We're the one. I, we carry the message. God equips us. We have the Holy Spirit within us. We have the Word of God. We have all we need, but we need to go out there and do the work, and we get to work together. He says right here, workers together with God. So I beseech you. I beg you. I plead with you. Don't receive uh, the grace of God in vain. And what does that mean? It means that it, you receive it, people hear it, you share the gospel, they hear the gospel, and they say, not for me. I, I don't want that. I'm not ready for that. Uh, there's something going on in my life right now I need to get rid of. And so they don't take it serious. What is God's grace? We know God's grace is unmerited favor, right? That's a, that's a technical term for it if you want to. What, is, what he's saying is God, through his grace, has provided redemption, that we can be bought out of the slave market of sin, that we can be redeemed to him, and also salvation. It's, it's a package deal, all this that we have, and God, through his grace, has provided that. So when we share the gospel with someone, and they can hear the word of God, they have the opportunity then to accept or reject it. And when you reject it, they hear it in, in vain with deaf ears. And we, so we, we need to be persistent uh, Sometimes I know that I, I know a man back in Illinois when I first got saved, and, and people sometimes thought he was overbearing with his what he'd witnessed everybody. I mean, he remember Keith, he would he would witness to everybody. He didn't, and sometimes he he really got to urging and beseeching and that, you know. And, and especially if he, I remember one day when he just a little side note, he was talking to a guy, and I knew the guy, but he, he drank beer, and Keith found out he was a beer drinker. Whew. And then he really told him he needed to be saved. He really got it. So, but we need to do it in love. We need to share the gospel in love. But we need to be, uh, I, I think we need to be more convicting. Sometimes we share the gospel and we're kind of apologizing. Like, you know, I, I don't want to offend you. I don't want to upset you. But you know what? When that person stands before the great white throne of God, if they receive, don't receive Christ and they stand before that great white throne, uh, they're not going to be worried about being offended because that's a, a permanent situation. It can't be changed. When we take it seriously, remember in, in the, the Gospels, what did Jesus talk about? What was his, what, when we talk about heaven and hell, which one did he talk about the most? Hmm? He didn't talk a lot about heaven, did he? Most of what we find about heaven is over in, in uh, the Revelation. He talked about condemnation, where the worm never dies. He talked about hell. Because that's why he came. He came to seek and to save. And so a benefit of the salvation is going to heaven. But the, the consequences of rejection is eternity in hell. And he didn't come to, to send people to hell. He came to allow people the opportunity to go to heaven. And so as we work together with him, we need to share that ministry of reconciliation. We need to let people know there is an opportunity. And it's not based on your works. It's not based on how good or bad you are. We all need it. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. None of us are righteous to start with. We all need to be reconciled to God. We all need to be delivered. So we need to share that story. And we need to be consistent with him. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. So we don't want to, to, to receive it in vain. That means it, it falls on those empty ears, those deaf ears. Has no, the person really don't care to hear it. You'd be surprised how many times that uh, uh, Linda would tell somebody, may the love of Jesus be in your heart, and they laugh. Like, what, are you, what are you talking about? I mean, it's not they don't bust up and laugh. But this guy laugh. <laughs> okay. No, because they don't understand. They don't understand what she's trying to say. She don't understand what it means to have the love of Jesus. So we, this, now is the time, verse 2, now is the time to accept it. He, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in a day of salvation have I succored to help thee. The, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And really the emphasis is now. The emphasis is now. How many people here today know that you'll be alive tomorrow? I many can say, yep, I know I'm going to be alive tomorrow. Not one of us can, can we? Not one of us can say, I know I'll be alive tomorrow. So if you're not safe, today is the day. Now is the appointed time. We, we, we take everything so much for granted. 
We don't know what's going to happen next. We've got to be ready, and the only way you can be ready is to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can't. Don't put it off. Don't, t- don't wait until the circumstances are such. If God is touching your heart, right now, if God is touching your heart, now is the time to repent and turn to him, put your faith and trust in Christ. You don't, don't even have to wait till the rest of the message. Don't even wait for the rest of the story. Now is the time, right in your pew, wherever you're at, wherever you're in front of a TV set or you're at home or in a car, wherever you're at, you can be saved right to there. I was saved driving down the road in a pickup truck. So you don't have to, you don't have to be in a church, you don't have to go to an altar, the old-fashioned altar, they say, you don't have to do that. But you do have to repent, you have to have a change of heart, humble of the heart, and then you put your faith and trust in Christ. And you need to do that immediately. When God touches your heart and gives you the desire to be saved, don't put it off and say, wait till tomorrow. I don't want to do it now. It would be embarrassing to go in front of all these people. No. This is the time. This is the hour. Over in Deuteronomy 30, 15, it says this. See, I have set before thee this day, this day, life and good, death and evil. When you feel the call of God, when you feel him touching you and, and working in your life, that is the time. He said, then you can take this verse right here. I have set before you the day, the, the good and the life and good or death and evil. It takes a decision. Man has to do something, not the works, not, not just to believe, but to faith and trust in Christ. It's a matter of just accepting what God says, accepting it as truth, believing what he says. That's what it's all about. And the third assignment we have, verses 3 and 4, chapter 6. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving yourself as the ministers of God. In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, and distresses. I just stopped here. There's a whole bunch of more that you can look at down through there. But these are the ones I, the reason I stopped right here is because I see these, these can be the things that really affect us today. We don't, most of us ain't going to face martyrdom or anything like that. But we're going to, we do face these uh, things that he talks about here in verse 4. He says, uh, and we do it, listen, then patience. Patience means endurance. And so how do we endure going through these times? When he talks about the afflictions, we talk about things that happen in our life that we can't control. There's stuff that happens inside of us, stuff happens outside of us. But he, verse 3 is really where I came to when I started this message. This is the verse that caught my eye. Giving no offense in anything. Offense means to be a stumbling block. That the ministry be not blamed. So what that wants to do is I want to be careful that I'm not a stumbling block to somebody. That somebody would reject Christ because of my testimony, because of what I've said or what I've done. And Paul says he don't want to be a stumbling block. We don't want to be there. So how can I be a stumbling block to somebody? Well, my testimony, right? And I'm not talking about my verbal testimony. I'm talking about my living testimony. When people see how I live, how I act, how I react. We talk about it all the time. The world today is full of hate, discontent. Everybody's all upset. It's chaotic. How do Christians react? Does the world see a difference in a Christian and a non-Christian? Does the world see a difference in you? He's talking about earlier that when he saw Christ in this person and he wanted what that person had. You know, we, we face a lot of things in life. And I don't understand them all. I can't understand them all. Why they happen to certain people and they don't happen to other people. And some, I, I just, and we shared in our prayer time uh, we share about people having, you know, uh, this one has cancer and this one is sick with something, the husband and wife, and they're both sick, they're both suffering, and there's people in the family that are sick. We don't understand why it is, but as Christians, we know that we are to carry on anyway. We're to keep the testimony. We keep the witness. And he says, sure, I don't want to do anything that the ministry would be blamed. The people, people are looking at the church, and they always want to find something wrong with the church. They're, and <laughs> the problem with it is, if they read the news very much, they find plenty of fodder. There's plenty out there that we do. Our leadership, especially leadership, you have to be careful how you live, how you project yourself in the community, how you project yourself in the world around you so people can see that you're different. And as, when you're in the leadership as a pastor or as somebody that's visible of representing a local church, you have to be sure that people see Christ in you, that the church be not blamed. Oh, those Baptists are all the same. 
Or we are independent. Right? We're independent Baptists. But the Bible bangers and all this stuff, we hear that talk about Baptists all the time. But they're always looking for something, and sure enough, pretty soon, uh, it's not so much in evangelism, evangelical churches, that you hear it publicly. You hear it more in the, in the Catholic Church's day. If you remember on all the things that the Catholic Church has gone through with the priest and all the stuff with the kids and that, and that, that stuff all gets put out there, you know, and people are looking at it and say, yeah, they see, that's a bunch. They, they, they fault them for that, and, and it happens in the churches too. So SBC has been through a bunch of that. See, people look at the church and say, you know what? They're no different than the world. That, that preacher run off with that woman. Uh, the world does that. That's, no, that's nothing unique. Nothing different. All these things they talk about kids, it's sick. So much this thing about this with the abuse of children in the ministry and how pastors and Sunday school teachers and youth leaders uh, get involved in, and mess with young kids. And it is what you, it, in my mind, you know, just a little side note, how can you get in the pulpit and preach and teach against things that you're practicing yourself? I don't understand it. I don't understand it. See, we have a responsibility. Not only we have the ministry of reconciliation, we're to be out there telling people about it, and then we're also to be sharing it and beseeching them, really urging them to receive Christ, and then we're to be living in such a way that people want to know Christ. So are you, is, can people see a difference in you? And we all have our different areas of influence. You know, sometimes it's just more in the local family. Sometimes it's in school or in the workplace. But are you different than the rest of the world around you? And I know sometimes we can get all caught up in things, but we've got to be careful that we don't get, have this anger, that we're not uh, this uh, unforgiving, tail-bearing, gossiping, indulging in a lifestyle that's unbecoming of a Christian. And see, the problem of it is, it's not that you won't be tempted in those things. It's not that we're not tempted. No, it's not, well, I'm a Christian now, I don't have to worry about it. No, the devil's going to leave me alone. Oh, no. He's going to pile it on more. He wants you to fall. He knows he can't get you to hell with him, but he wants to run your testimony that he can use you as a stumbling block to the unsaved around you. So we need to be aware of this. And it's not something that you can just now and then think about. We need to have, it needs to become a lifestyle, really. When you make a decision on what you're going to do, you, you have to make that decision based on how will this look for me as a Christian? How will my neighbors, how will my family even look at me? Because he goes ahead and says right here that the, that the ministry be not blamed. We've got to be careful in how we act. I've got a couple of verses I want to look at here. And one of them is a familiar verse. I like this verse because it's so plain. So it, uh, it talks about David and Bathsheba. Remember David and Bathsheba in the story? And Nathan the prophet comes to Jesus, and or, not, to, to David, and he uh, confronts him with his sin. And over in, in 2 Samuel 12, 13 and 14, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die, because according to Old Testament, adultery should be, uh, should be killed. How be it, verse 14, How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto you shall surely die. But I like that part right there. He said, what you have done, you give the enemies of God great material, great power to blaspheme the name of God. Look at David, a man after God's own heart, a king, and look what he did. What kind of Christian would do that? We can talk about that Old Testament. I know he's not a Christian, but they look at today. What kind of Christian would act like that? Philippians 2.15, go a little bit in the New Testament. Philippians 2.15, he says over here, I'll find it, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke. And listen to this now. And here's where you're at. You're in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven, right? And that's our call. That's, what, that's our ministry verse. That's why I picked that verse, because we have that responsibility. It's not an option. It's a command, and it's a responsibility to show Christ to this world around us. 
that people through us will see Jesus Christ because that's the only way they're going to see him. Verse 4, but in all things, approving or commending ourselves as ministers of God. The word minister here has the idea of being, if you have ever seen one of these uh, old movies where they have the, the ships going out there and you see the, the oars coming out of the side of the ship and there's one, two, three. Well, this is, as a minister here, you're, at, you're in the bottom. You're the one. You're, you are the, the servant. And you're the servant of all. You and I as Christians, we are, the, we are to be the servant for the Lord. We're to be the ones, we're not to get any acclaim, we're to be the servant. To God be the glory for you and I to be down there that sweating it out to bring him the glory. That's our call. That's our responsibility. So, the obvious question is, how are you doing? How are you doing? Are you, are you fulfilling your assignments? Are you doing your part to reach the world for Christ? And we says right here at the end of that verse, in much endurance. And you're going to go through afflictions. You're going to go through the necessities. You're going to go through the distresses and all those things down through there. But he says, with much endurance. I don't give up and I don't give in. Afflictions have the idea of the pressure, the strain, the tension that comes from within and without, whether it's in here or out here. Necessities is inescapable hardship, difficulties, pain of life. Distresses, straits, calamities, tight places. What it amounts to is that sometimes we get caught up and we get so much put down on us, it don't seem like we can get up. Sometimes it feels like it's weighing us down so much it just don't seem to be any relief. And we don't know where to turn. We don't know what to do. We start, so, we get, start to get overcome and, and we forget. Listen, we forget when our circumstances get so bad, we forget what we have and who we are and what we have to look forward to. Who we are, what we have, and what we have to look forward to. And we, when we get that in proper perspective, then we will walk in this world in such a way that the world will see a difference. Because the world has none of that. The world has nothing to look forward to except what the world has to offer. We have everything. We have eternity. You know that? There's that day coming that we're going we're gonna to hear that trump, we're going to hear the shout, and the dead in Christ arise first, and we which are alive will follow them. And we know that that's the end of all the trouble, all the sorrow, all the pain for you and I. And the only problem we have, and we won't even be thinking about it, but those that are being left behind. It's time to think about the left behind ones of the day. This is the day. As I said earlier, this is, now is the time of salvation. Now is the time for you and I to share the gospel, to tell people about Jesus. So what's your walk like? Do they see the life of a Christian, or do they see the life of someone in the world? It's up to you. You know, you determine that. That's one thing that we talk about all the time, about predestination, elect, and free will, and all that. But you have, the, you live this life in such a way that you either bring glory to God, or you bring your stumbling block as a Christian. You have to make that choice. You hit to choose day by day, when you're faced with a temptation, when you're faced in a trial, which way you're going to turn Will the world see Christ in me, or are they going to see me fitting in with the world? If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is the day. This is the hour. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? I must repent. I must have a change of heart. I must repent. A changed heart says, you know what, God, I know I'm a sinner. I deserve to die in my sin. There's nothing good about me, but your son went, and he went to the cross. He shed his blood as payment for my sin. I'm believing that. I'm trusting that. And when you do that from the heart, God says you're forgiven of your sin. There's no condemnation for your sin. And you have a home in heaven just waiting for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. <clears throat> we thank you for this time, Lord, that we can come before your throne of grace. Lord, we pray that we would be found faithful to carry out our assignments, to do our part in this walk of life here on earth, that we might see people come to know Christ as, our, as their Savior, Lord. Sometimes we get challenged and times get tough and hard, Lord. But we know that you're with us through it all. You promised you would never leave us nor forsake us. And you're going to walk with us, Lord, and we just thank you for that truth. But for those that don't know Christ, we pray this would be the day that they would repent, that they would change their destiny, change their eternal destiny from hell to heaven. 
It's so simple to do, but it takes faith. Faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you for what you've done. Look into the future for what you're going to do. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.